tonight there's going to be a uh, going to be an all-star game basketball the NBA they're going to have their all-star game here's one thing that I know that's going to happen if you watch you got the best players from the teams there's good players on every team every team has five or six incredible basketball players but only two or three are going to be on the all-star team and here's what's going to happen normally these guys that would shoot are going to dribble around and instead of shooting they're going to give an assist and it's the only time you'll ever see it because in a, in a regular basketball game you may see one assist you may see a great guard make a dynamic pass to some guy down low so he can dunk it not in the all-star game in the all-star game you're going to see some guy dribbling he's got a shot instead he'll pass it behind him to some other guy over here and that guy will fake his guy out and he'll have a clean shot but instead instead of taking that shot he'll throw it up toward the basket and some other guy trailing him running down the court in midair will grab it out of the air and dunk it it's magnificent you only see it in the NBA all-star game I feel like I'm in the NBA all-star game I just had two great assists you know what I'm saying Sean gets up here and explains truth better than I'm going to do today. I hope you were paying attention. All right? So, you know, I thought she was going to shoot, but no, she passed the ball. <laughs> then I went over here to David. And I thought David was going to shoot. But I'm still running down the court, and I'm flying up in the air. He didn't shoot, and he's just pitched it up in the air. Now, I have the task of in midair grabbing what it is that he's done, and dunking it. I'm a little worried. I'm a little worried. I can't, I, I'm not going to kid you. Because when I played basketball, you know how you get a, you get a nickname <laughs> when you play basketball? I remember my son would be out playing basketball and they give each other names, you know. And, and I, I'm walking out there and they're going, Yo, money. And I'm like, Yo, money. Why don't you guys give, give yourself names that are real, like, Yo, moocher. <laughs> yo, credit. You know, but, but, but when, I, when I played, my nickname was the bricklayer. So I'm a little worried, but I'm going to talk to you about the truth. Really what I'm going to do is I'm going to summarize the truth for you because Jesus summarized the truth for his men at the Lord's Supper. Um, there's a beginning, the truth is the cure for heart trouble. Uh, you know, and I'm not talking about the kind of heart trouble where you have a cardiac problem and you have to go see the heart doctor and he defines what the problem is and comes up with some sort of system to take care of your heart trouble. I'm talking about the heart trouble that is caused by the lies that we share, by the lies that are a part of us, and by the lies that are around us. I mean, how difficult is it to find the truth today? To get the truth, to get the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. If you've, ever, if you've ever testified in a court of law, they still ask that question. In a, in a world that is becoming more and more hedonistic, more of a culture that is becoming more and more without God, you still put your hand on the Bible and you swear that you will, you will tell the truth and nothing but the truth and the whole truth. I know some people that tell the truth, you just rarely get the whole truth. You get a little part of the truth, you get a little some of the truth, you get the truth according to them, right? So we're seeking truth. And when we don't get it, it creates this kind of heart difficulty. I'm talking about your emotions. I'm talking about when you feel all stressed out. In John 14, 1, uh, he starts this portion of scripture by saying, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. See, what he knew was he's coming to the end of his life. This is Thursday of Passover week, and he's, he's beginning the Lord's Supper. He's going to spend time with them, and this is going to be the last focused, intimate time they have. And they are stressed out. They're so stressed out, they forget, to, they forget that somebody needs to, to wash their feet. Jesus ends up toweling up, and he ends up becoming the servant. And, and Peter even resists it. And they're stressed. 
They, uh, amongst them is, is one who's going to betray Christ, Judas, creating tension in the room, creating even more stress. They're coming off a, a, a dinner last night where they were all stressed. And, and so he's saying, don't, don't stress. If, I'll give you the California version. You all need to chill. Okay? And there's another time in verse 27, he says, I am leaving you with a gift. Peace. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. If you know Christ as your personal Savior, then you know the truth. And since you know the truth, there's no need for you to be troubled in your heart. And yet, Jesus knew what it was like to have a troubled heart. Matter of fact, uh, I found three verses that talk about him having a troubled heart. Uh, in John eleven thirty eight, 38, it says, And Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across the, in, the, in the entrance. Now, this is at Lazarus' grave. And it says that Jesus was still angry. He had a troubled heart. Who was he angry at? Was he angry at Martha because she's bawling him out? No. Mary because she can't be consoled? No, not at all. He's angry at death. He's angry at the final enemy. And so he does something magnanimous that shows the final enemy that they're on borrowed time. And he brings him back alive. He also, in that instance, shows us that you and I can be angry and not sin. I love it when people say, you know, if, if you're angry, you're sinning. Maybe not. Maybe if you're angry, there's a reason for that emotion, and God wants to take that emotion, and he wants to use that emotion in a creative, constructive way. Now, just be flying off the handle and be angry and be, be turning the, the sky blue. That's, anybody can do that. But when you have a troubled heart, you do as Jesus did. He had anger, but he didn't sin goes on in John 12, 27. It says, now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. He's in the garden. He is so stressed out that he is sweating blood. There's actually blood coming from the corpuscles of his forehead. That, that also is that's not a good thing. If you ever get that stressed out, you need to get to the doctor because it's a, it's a terrible thing to begin to happen to your body. And it's, it's like a shutdown that's going on. And he was that troubled. And, and you say, was he, was, he all that, was he that troubled because of the cross? No. Jesus knew that he was going to die on a cross. He knew from eternity past what the plan was. It was made up between the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son of God. He knew that he would die on Passover. He knew that it would be on a cross. He knew it would be a Roman trial. He knew all of that. What he was sweating blood about was he also knew that for the first time, for the only time in all of eternity, he would be emotionally separated from God. Do you know what that means? It means for the first time, he wouldn't feel God's presence. I think about us and we, we sin and we fall out of fellowship with God and we lose God's presence in our life and we don't think much about it and then later we come to him and, and we confess and and, and God is, is faithful and true to, to forgive our sins, and he comes back into your life a little bit. But then we plan, plan our time away from God. For three hours. Matter of fact, hanging from the cross, he would say, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he wasn't saying, why have you turned away from me? He was saying, this is the beginning of the three hours that's going to mean salvation for eternity for all mankind. In Hebrew, it's, in, it's in, interesting, that's the only verse in the Bible, in the New Testament, that is in Hebrew. 
And it's in Hebrew because the emphasis is not on why hast thou forsaken me. It's on the words, my God, my God. Jesus called his father. My father who is in heaven 127 times. 37 times he said, your father who is in heaven. One time. One time. My God, my God. Because he didn't feel the presence of God. But he knew he was there. What a great lesson. Sometimes you're so stressed out, your heart is so troubled, you don't feel God's presence. That's when it's important that you remember that you belong to him. Why? Because he died for you. You accepted him in your heart. And because he is your father, because he knows your name, because he made you, like what David was talking about, you belong. There's a crisis in the church of Jesus Christ today. People get into trouble. They make their own trouble. Trouble comes upon them, and they start believing, maybe I'm not even saved. Maybe God has abandoned me. No, no. You are just in a, my God, my God phrase. Phase. He is still there. Then in, in another time, in John 13, 21, it says, Now Jesus was deeply troubled, and he explained, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. He was deeply troubled. He knew. He knew he was losing Judas. He already knew what Judas had done. And he knew. And it deeply troubled him. So you can be deeply troubled and even angry and not sin. Because Jesus showed us how to do that. So now let me take you to John 14, verses 1 through 3, because this is where I'm going to land in these first seven verses of chapter 14. And the biblical context is, of course, the, the Lord's Supper. And they are about to die, and Jesus is, is there with them, and, and he says to them, don't let your hearts be troubled, indicating their hearts are troubled, indicating that they are all stressed out. Yeah, you know, I'm experiencing a lot of trouble-hearted people these days. You know, when people come to counseling, their heart is troubled. But when when now now it's not just people coming to counseling, it's it's COVID. It's COVID. Do you, you know? Do you, uh, I I heard this, and I'm I'm sure it's true because I saw it on Facebook. Um, <laughs> that COVID, spelt backwards, is the Hebrew word, uh, uh, the coming of an evil spirit. I thought that was fascinating. I don't know if that's true, but it feels like it. It feels like it. People are so weirded out. They're so edgy. Suicide for, for kids, suicide for adults. Everything is way up. People are on edge. If, you're, if you're, you're calling somebody for customer service, how's that going for you? I can't find customer service anymore. I, you know, it doesn't matter what you're talking about. You know, you, uh, I went into Best Buy, went over to the Geek Squad. The geek looked at me and goes, what do you want? And I'm like, well, I, I don't really know. That's why I'm coming to you. Well, explain it the best you can. And so I do. And he says, well, you don't want me. You want the guy over in the TVs. And I'm like, okay. Anybody special over there I ask for as I step away? I mean, everybody's like that. So Jesus is saying, all right, guys, calm down. And one of the reasons he's saying is, it, it, it be, is because the next few hours are going to be brutal on everybody. He needs to calm down. And he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. Then he says, there is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, I would have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you. And when everything is ready, I will come and I will get you so that you will always be with me where I am. So Jesus is announcing to them, 
that he's going to die and he's going to go to his father's house. And you might remember this in, in the King James. It says, in my father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. It really doesn't, the word's not mansion, it's rooms. It's rooms. In, in, in that culture, the father would build a room when the, when the son or the daughter got old enough and build a room for them to, to live in that same home. It, it really means an apartment. We don't get the mansion, okay? God has the mansion. We get a room, an apartment. Um, all of us have had that experience, haven't we? I remember Donna and I's first apartment. The walls were about that thin. And we lived right next door, right next door to the guy that ran the whole apartment complex. And he would occasionally let us know that the walls were that thin. And we would know they, the walls were that thin because when I'd go into the bathroom and open the medicine cabinet, I could smell his cigar. That's not the kind of apartment we're talking about. We're talking about a glorious place. Jesus is not up in heaven just hanging out with God, sitting back on the, on the right hand of the Father, on his throne doing absolutely nothing. Jesus is doing two things, and he explains what those two things are right here. I go to prepare a place for you. So he's preparing a place for you. Second job he's doing in your life is he's preparing you for the place. Those are, those are God's two jobs, Jesus' two jobs from heaven. He's preparing a place for you, and he's preparing you for the place. In, in verses 4 and 5, he says, And you know the way to where I'm going. This is when, finally, one of the disciples uh, speaks up. There, there are not 12 disciples any longer. Judas has left the room. And so Thomas finally speaks up. This, this also speaks wonderfully of Jesus' teaching style. You know, Jesus always allowed his, his men to interrupt him at any point. You know, the great teachers love that. The great teachers pause and they wait for a reaction. Matter of fact, the, the, the great profs will will say something, and then they'll just wait. And the, the, the silence becomes deadly until finally somebody in the classroom asks the question. In this case, it was Thomas. Now, we know Thomas as doubting Thomas, and he's got kind of a bad rap because he's a courageous character. As a matter of fact, when Jesus said, well, I'm putting my face toward Jerusalem to die, Peter's trying to stop him, and, and all the other disciples are wondering what's going on. You know what Thomas said? Okay, let's go to Jerusalem and die. He was ready to die with the Savior. And so now he asked the question, and, and he's asking the question for the group. He says, no, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you are going so how can we know the way? We don't have a clue. I've also been in that class where the prophet spoke for about an hour. And he said, so you all understand what I'm saying? No, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. You're two feet high and one over my head. I don't, I don't have any of this down. And this is a question of panic. He blurts it out and said, Lord, we, we have no idea what you're talking about. I mean, look around. Look at how dumbfounded everybody looks. We don't know. How are we supposed to know? You haven't said. Truth is, he has said it over and over and over again. And the disciples have forgotten it as quickly as he, said, as he has said it. So, so Jesus answers in, in 6 and 7. He says, Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's the greatest truth you will ever hear. This is, this is the beginning, the middle, and the end of all truth. If you have lived your life, those of you that are listening online, and you've lived your life wondering what the truth of life is, there it is. There it is. God did not hide the truth. He made it as simple as as he could. Jesus says it as clear as anybody could say it. I am the way. 
I am the truth. I am the life. And then listen to what he says. No one can come to the Father except through me. Now, one of the things that you get criticized for in Christianity is because you believe Jesus is the only way. And why do you believe that? Because it's true. Is anything else true? No. On Wednesday night, we, we looked at science and, and, and biblical truth. And we looked at how closely together they are aligned. The world would have you think that, that the, although the book, the Bible is not a book of science, it's never scientifically been proven incorrect. And so there's so many things that dovetail with the truth of science and the truth of, of the Bible. And here's one thing about truth. When you look at science, you, you realize that it's very, very narrow. Like if you're describing water, you say it's H2O. It's made up of two parts of hydrogen and one part of oxygen. That's the only way water comes. You cannot scientifically add anything else to water and have it be water. The truth of science is narrow. The truth within Scripture is narrow. And the truth coming from the lips of Jesus, the most dynamic truth that was ever spoken by the most dynamic person that ever lived, the one who is giving you life and life uh, more abundantly, the, the one who is bringing the joy that life has to bring, says, I am the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And he said, if you had really known me, you would know who my father is. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. You have seen him. And this is the essence, the truth. This is the thing that riled up the Pharisees. This is the truth that everybody tried to tamp down, that every tri everybody tried to run away with. And the world has not changed. You remember the movie, A Few Good Men? Right? Remember, you know, he, he, says, he, said, he, said, he said, what do you want? And the lawyer says, I want the truth. I want the truth. That crusty old Marine looked at him and said, you can't handle the truth. I want to look at the world sometimes when they go, I want the truth. I want to just yell at him, you can't handle the truth. Because the truth is, Jesus is the way. He's the truth. He's the life. No man can come to the Father except through him. If you have seen him, if you know him, you know the Father. There's your truth. There's your truth that expands all other truth. That's the essence of life. It is the focus of the entire book of Scripture. Old Testament, New Testament, any one part of it, anything, it all points to that truth. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. So let's look at what that means. When Jesus says, I'm the way, he, the, the way is life-finding. Um, uh, we, we, uh, we heard Sean quote Proverbs 14, 12. There's a path before each person that seems right but it ends up in death. Jesus is saying, I'm the path. I'm the way. Uh, no journey is possible without a path. You have to have a way. Uh, man's, path is God, uh, man's, path is to, man's path to God is Jesus. There is no other path. I love the words of Yogi Berra. He said, when you come to a fork in the road, Take it. That's the way a lot of people are living their lives. Just kind of wandering around, wondering, am I on the right path? Do I, am I going the right direction? Uh, I'm so thrilled we have smartphones. Some of you are old enough to remember when we didn't have a smartphone. You know what you carried around in your car? A maps go. You carried around a map that was at least this big. And it always sat next to you. And your wife always had to move it. 
to sit down. But it couldn't go far. And you took care of it because it's the only way you knew how to get around. And if you're like me and you, get, you had an address and that's all you had. And I lived in Los Angeles. That's hard to get around. I mean, you get down to the mix master in Los Angeles and you're confronted with the Riverside, the San Diego, the Harbor, the 605, the 405. I mean, they all hit together. And you don't know which one of these to take to go whatever direction. I remember on the news they would have people and they, they would find one of them in, in, in Culver City and they'd find the other one in Pasadena. If you're not from L.A., those are far apart. And they'd be on the side of the road. The boys and dad in the truck with all the furniture. Mom and the girls in the station wagon over here. And they would show them reuniting them because they got lost on the Los Angeles freeways. Boom. That way, try again, didn't work, try again, didn't work. You had a MAPSCO. That was it. And it had, it, had, it had letters across top, and it had numbers down the side. And so to read it, you had to get out. Usually, I'd get out of my car. I'd lay it down on the hood, and I'd go, okay, address. And I'd look at the address, and then you'd go over to the table of contents. You'd find the address, and it'd say P12, page 109. All right? You get over to page 109. And you go over to P, and you go down to 12, and you had to look around in a space about that big to find that street, and you, you found it. You got it. Okay, where am I now? And you had to look at where you were now, and then you had to do the same thing all over again, and then you had to put it together so that you knew how to get there. Oh, man. I love my smartphone. In a quarter of a mile... Fair to the left. Okay. You know, she never gets upset. And if you make a mistake, uh, in a quarter of a mile, make a U-turn. Right? Don't you wish, don't you wish you just, you know, they, they gave you a path. You got a path. I got, I always have a path. Wherever I want to go, I now have a path. Wouldn't it be wonderful to turn that on? After your 86 years on sinful highway, veer to the right. Veer to the right, and that will put you on the righteous highway to the freeway to heaven. You know, I mean, they're just, okay. And you just follow the, what well, we do. We got a path. The path is you're on sinful freeway, right? And as soon as you can, you need to get off to the gospel. And as soon as you hear the gospel, you need to accept Jesus because he's the way, true, and the life. And he's a right-hand turn. And it's up there about a quarter of a mile. And then when you get there, you need to get on, you, you get on the, the road to righteousness that leads to the freeway to heaven. It's right there. You got it. You know, the people in the Bible that first accepted Christ as their personal Savior, they were actually called people of the way. Back in the 70s, a drugged-up group decided to follow Jesus, and they said they became the people of the way, and they kind of had it all messed up. But in the early, early makings of the early church, they would call themselves the way. The way we know that is in Acts 9, 1 and 2, Paul uh, went to the head priest and, and, and asked for permission to go uh, persecute the people of the way. This was when he was Saul. This was before his conversion. And then... Uh, and then when Paul was converted, we hear that in uh, 19, 8 and 9 of Acts that he was one of the people of the way. And in Acts 19, 23, there was an absolute riot because in Ephesus, people were getting saved and nobody were, was buying any more of all of the things that they did to make phony gods. And they were called the way. So Jesus is the way. Then he says he's the truth. And the truth is life-giving. Truth is the scarcest of all commodities in the world. Do you realize that? Uh, there is, there's no search that has lasted as long and produced more incorrect answers than the search for truth. Every night, you're going to turn the news on. What are you seeking? The truth. What will you get? God only knows. I know what you're not going to get. You're not going to get the truth. All search for truth ends 
in the life of Jesus. The way, the truth, and the life. I know uh, one of the most interesting parts of John is in chapter 18, verses 37 and 38. He's standing before Pilate, and Pilate said, So, you are a king. And Jesus responded, and I, I just love the way Jesus responds. He is so brilliant in the way he says things. He doesn't just come right out and say, yeah, I'm a king. I'm the king of glory. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He looks at Pilate, and he says, you say I am a king. Actually, I was born, and I came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. What a great answer. He is inviting Pilate in to hear the truth. He's looking at this man that thinks he's in charge. Who is, who is about to lose everything in life. Matter of fact, he's about to make the most critical mistake a man could probably make. And then, and then it's going to drive him crazy. Eventually, he's going to commit suicide. This is a guy who thinks he's in charge. And Jesus looked at him and he said, you say that I'm a king. And I came here to tell the truth. And you're looking at the truth. You're staring at the truth. And look at his answer. What is truth? And I want you to know a rejected truth is still true. An unrecognized truth is still true. You know, I, I love preachers when they get up and they say, you know, if, if Jesus isn't Lord of all in your life, then he's not Lord at all. Now, that's a great sounding preacher thing to say, but it's theologically whacked. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is who, is who he said he is, <laughs> whether you're acting like it or not. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except him. When you have seen him, when you have recognized him in the pages of Scripture, when you know him, you've seen the Father. Pilate didn't receive the truth. But here's the interesting thing about Pilate. He didn't deny it. He heard the truth. He knew that was true. First thing he did is he walked over and he told the Jewish leaders, I find no fault in this man. He knew Jesus was right. He knew what he said was real. This is one of the saddest things in all humanity when the gospel is shared and you hear the truth and you know it's true and you sense that it's true and you know it's the only thing that, that you haven't tried or un understood and you walk away from it because you think that can't possibly be that simple. And it is. It's a sad, that's, that's maybe one of the most poignant saddest portions of scripture to see this guy reject Jesus because he thought he didn't need him he thought the truth wasn't important or he thought he was more important than truth and no one is then the next one he says I am the way I am the truth then he says I am the life life is hope made real. Life is, is, is hope made real. The dynamics that, that make our relationship with God possible is the principle of spiritual vitality. It originates with God. It flows through Christ. It lifts us out of sin and places us in a relationship with Christ alone, making life with God attainable. That's what he meant when he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. I am the essence of who God is. I am the dynamic of everything God is. I am the vitality within the spiritual life that you're going to lead. I am the one that can take over your emotions and your mind and your troubled heart and give you eternity, give you a relationship with holy God. And you get righteousness at the point of your salvation. 
Righteousness comes in two ways. There is a, a righteousness that we express when we know Christ and we're obedient to him and we behave righteously, but that's not the righteousness that gets you to heaven. That's not a part of the way, the truth, and the life. By grace, God allows you to understand righteousness, but you're, you're, you're not fully righteous. But the second way that you are righteous is in him. God gives you an imputed righteousness because Jesus is the way. When you accept him, his righteousness becomes your righteousness. When you die, when you go to heaven, you're not going to get there on your righteousness. Now, I'm not telling you you don't have to be righteous. Be as righteous as you possibly can. Work at it with all your heart, soul, and strength. But understand, when you get to heaven and you step up, you step up on the, on, the, on the basis of the righteousness of God in Christ alone. Jesus said, that one's mine. And you're in. He's not going to look down and say, now that one ought to get in. He did good worship. No. He's not going to say, that one, that one ought to get in. He taught Sunday school. No. That one, that one ought to get in. He was really nice to his neighbor. And no. That one gets in because of the righteousness of God in Christ. He gets in because the truth is, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man gets in except through him. Christianity is not a system of philosophy or a, a book of rules or rituals or reputation. It's not a code of ethics that demands certain things. God originates life to one who has no life in himself. That's what getting saved means. It means God originated it. You have no life. You're breathing. You're walking around. But you don't know the truth. And I can take you from dead to life, to life everlasting. By understanding that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. God takes a dead thing in us, our sinfulness, and he saves it on the cross. And he becomes the substitute for you. And you, th though you are dead, you accept Christ as your personal Savior, you are now alive, more alive than you've ever been more filled with joy than you've ever been, more filled with wisdom than you've ever been, more filled with God than you ever knew anything about. That's what Christianity is. Jesus is the one who gives life. He gives the true dynamics of life, the true vitality in life. And Jesus is the only way to God, and no one comes to the Father except through him. When you know the truth, you repeat it. So the truth, Jesus, is I am the way. I am the way which must be followed. I am the truth which must be believed. I am the life which, which man must hope. Thomas Aquinas said of this verse, and I love this, without the way, no journey can be taken. Without the truth, no one can be known. Without life, no life can be lived. Truth is, Jesus gave all that. Gave it. So, what about this truth? What about it? What, what makes it significant? Besides that it is the only great truth in all of life. What does it change? Well, how, does it, how does it make you think different? I, I could have I listed a thousand things. I, I, I boiled it down to three. It relieves my fear of being lost. When I know that's the truth, I'm no longer lost. Have, have you ever been lost? You, if you've ever, you ever been a child that, that got lost and you looked up, I mean, you were at a mall or you were somewhere and, and, and you wandered away from your parents and you were lost? The, the most frightened I've ever been is when I was lost. When I looked around and I couldn't find Corky and Ellie 
and I was lost. I must have enjoyed some part of that because I used to get lost all the time. You know that stay right there, I'm going to be right back, don't move. Don't move, got it? I'll be right back, stay right there. You know, they had to say it three times. And I'm like, yeah, I got it, got it, got it. Okay, I'm bored after about 30 seconds, and I'm gone. And I'm lost, and I'm frightened. You know, you might be living your whole life, and you're afraid you're lost. You're lost. I remember being 17 years old. I remember having the world by the tail. I was an excellent baseball player. I was headed for something. I was achieving on the athletic field. I, I, I had dated every pretty girl in the school, every one of them. I dated a couple ugly ones, too, but they were nice. They had good personality ones. I had lots and lots and lots of friends. I was passing most of my classes. I had the world by the tail. I had great parents. I, I loved my family. But one day, I got frightened. And what frightened me was I was lost. I knew I was lost. Several of my friends had taken some drugs and decided that they were super people, and so they raced a train, and the train won. And six of my classmates died. And I remember going to that funeral. I remember leaving that field, a funeral as scared as I've ever been in my entire life. I was frightened because I had no idea where I would go if I were to die. And the preacher who preached their funeral gave me no solace whatsoever. And that fear, that initial fear of death, brought in enough fear of God that I accepted Christ as my personal Savior. And for the first time in my life, I wasn't afraid of death. That's what you get. When you get the truth, it relieves your fear of being lost. Nobody can, can convince me that I am lost ever again. Not even me. I would be the most powerful source of talking myself into that I'm lost, but I can't. Why? Because I know the truth of Scripture. I know what Jesus said. He said he's the way, the truth, and the life, and anybody that comes to him finds the Father. So it relieves the fear of being lost. If you're afraid today, all you have to do is come to the way, the truth, and the life, and you'll not be afraid ever again. God will relieve that fear. Second thing, it removes my need to continue my search for what is true. I'm not groping in the dark trying to figure out what's true and what's not true. I'm not confused by education or by, by anything that, that I read in the Bible. I'm not confused by what I hear from philosophy. I'm not confused what I see in my government. I'm just not. That all has been removed. I don't need to continue to look for what the truth is. I found the truth. So if you found the truth, why would you wander off? Why would you get off track? Why would you take another path? You know? It's almost like your inner spiritual life. needs. You need to hear that the girl in the navigation thing. Return to the root. Return to the root. Make a U-turn. Get back to the truth. The third thing, it reinforces my relationship with God and my hope for heaven. The truth is a refreshment, a delight, a reset. The greatest thing about my smartphone is when it acts up, I can turn it off. And when you turn it back on, whoop, magically everything works again. For the most part. It is AT&T after all. But that's what a relationship with God does. It reinforces the hope you have for heaven. Some of you that know Jesus as your personal Savior need to return to that absolute truth. Reset your heart. Maybe your heart's been troubled a little too long. 
And just like the disciples, Jesus is saying, you know, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. You know this. You have seen the Father. Reset your heart. Hit the button. Start over. Wake up again to a glorious, wonderful salvation that God calls us to. And do it now. Perhaps you've never, ever accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. Perhaps you've never taken in that absolute and complete truth in your life. And you're still troubled in your heart. Most simple thing in the world to do is respond to God and say, God, I'm accepting that truth into my life. Come into my heart and save me. I want you to stand and... No, I don't. I want you to stay seated. Because you're going to stay seated at home. We know that. Um, but I, I want you to hear... Uh, David's going to sing an incredible song about truth. And I just want you to let it to wash over you. And I want you to think about the truth that God has given. Even just this day. And I want you to bask in his truth. If you need to know Jesus during this time, just say, God... Come into my heart. Save me. I accept all of what I've just heard as the absolute truth, even for me.